Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Just before we start, in the midst of all the excitement, I think you forgot something. So the management asked if we would do this just uh, before we start the meeting, big crowd. And so down at the bottom here it says, um, <clears throat> message from the management. In case of fire, um, would all members of Alcoholics Anonymous please remain seated until the al have vacated the premises? <laughs> In case I tank, I'd like to thank you in advance for the gift. (laughs) I'm a slowly recovering Al-Anon, and my name is Rick. Good evening to you all. As you're known to say up and around Omaha, and as you kind of say here in Colorado slash Texas, by the, by the grace of God and the uh, power of a program called the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, which, as our tradition says, I practice myself, a fellowship called the al Family Groups, and the loving but very firm guidance of a big book black belt al sponsor. It has not been necessary for me to plan any kind of death, yours or mine, since the 10th day of April, 1987, and for that I most certainly am grateful. <laughs> My new hometown is Oakville, Ontario, Canada. I moved there just a year ago. Now, I don't know how long you have to be in a place before it's not new, but I lived in Toronto for 53 years, and so I've only been in Oakville for one year, so it's going to be new for, new for a while. Oakville's a little town about 40 minutes to the west, of, west side of Toronto. And my home group is the Saturday morning Oakville al family group, a very inspiring group with a totally uninspiring name. I'm new in the group, and I said that to them one time, and they didn't think it was very funny. I said, you know, it's kind of like naming your child by the day that they're born. You know, here's uh, you know, July 13th and my, my daughter November 5th. I kind of thought it was funny, but they were like typical al you know, a pickle stuck up their arse. <laughs> Kind of get that Alan on smile. <laughs> this is serious. I'm an alcoholic husband, you know. Yes, I know. I can tell by your face. I uh, want to thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to this, this really a marvelous, marvelous get-together. I, I first heard of the Crested Buttes Mountain Conference <laughs> on, a, on a ferry, on, on kind of on a, on, on a lake cruise in 1993 in Toronto. We were celebrating the second, our second area al conference in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of Alcoholics Anonymous in Canada. And we had invited Beverly and Buddy Ross as our speakers. Wonderful people, absolutely. And uh, I, I was their host, and so I had a marvelous, marvelous chat with them. And we were on this kind of like a dinner cruise around the harbor in Toronto, and they were telling me about, you know, we were just talking. And she mentioned this Crested Butte Mountain Conference. I thought, oh boy, that sounds pretty nice. And so when when, when I got the, uh, the the call from Sarah to come, I thought, well, hey, that's pretty cool. That would really be a fun fun to attend that. Little did I know that she would be calling me every day for the next two years, but. <laughs> It's kind of another an, an, another story. I, I'm particularly be, particularly honored to be here with the the other speakers. It really is lovely to be included in, in a slate of speakers with the kind of recovery that we have heard thus far, and I know that we are about to hear. So so honestly, I, I do thank you, thank you for that very 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 much. I thank you for showing up to an Al-Anon meeting. I know when you're out there drinking and somebody said, hey, if you stop drinking, you're going to get to come out to Crested Butte and Wednesday night listen to some blabbermouth from Canada and talk about the family disease of alcoholism, you would have stopped drinking sooner. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I want to do that. <laughs> well, that'd be fun. But I, I especially want to thank, thank Sarah for the, um, you know, for the never-ending phone calls 
for the for the ongoing emails for the postcards. <laughs> right, we got postcards, right? We got couriered information about Crested Butte. And, and it was really all very, very, very wonderful. So, so thank you for that. But, but lastly, I, I absolutely have to thank you for that little black dress. <laughs> because if you are an Al Anon of my type, a petite, cute, effervescent female alcoholic wearing a just right black dress. There's only one word for that in my vocabulary. Hot. <laughs> and the fact that you're doing that five nights in a row, well, that's the stuff that my fantasies are made of. I don't know about you guys. But <laughs> it's just, uh, I don't know. I, Alcohol never did it for me, but a female alcoholic, oh my God, you can dive in there and lose yourself for years. <laughs> Looking after them, trying to get them to do stuff, trying to fix them. I mean, you, just, you can just vanish forever. It's just, like it's, it's heaven. <laughs> really, really. You don't have to go through that cycle. I'm drinking, I'm sick, I'm going to drink again. You just don't do that. You just stay sick all the time with them, but you think you're good. It's amazing. It's, a, it's kind of the disease that we suffer from is, is really, really quite remarkable. And, and I, it's so lovely to see Tim K and, and Rhonda G now H, and and, and, and Larry and, uh, and, and and you know C D Lee back there. And it's not 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 <laughs> a nice new title for you, Lee. So it's C dot D dot Lee, not S E E D Y. But uh, if you hear his story, you might disagree. <laughs> C D Lee <laughs> took a while. Come on, I know it's high altitude, but that's a good joke. <laughs> anyway, it is particularly um, particularly lovely. I, I got to say to to see Ellen and Beverly, uh, two fine fine members of Al Anon, who I've had occasion to be with on weekends, and who I know uh, have given yeoman service to members of Al Anon, North American and even worldwide, to help them on their journey of recovery from the family disease of alcoholism. And you're looking at one Al Anon member who is the benefit of their the sharing that they give for fun and for free. So I extend to you my, my great gratitude, my friendship, and deep respect for who you are as members of this, of this fellowship. And give them a bit of applause because, hey, they're, from, they're yours. I, I think it's particularly poetic that at an AA conference, the longest, the person that's been there the longest is an al It's So way to go, Alan. That's just great. <laughs> And one of the things that, that you get to see when you, you know, travel around like this is you get to see all these neat little things that you do at, at, at conferences. And, and I think the thing that you did on Monday was, was one of the more beautiful ones that I've ever seen. And that is bringing your children out, you know, make, make it with that little banner presentation and standing up and applauding for them. My, my sponsor says it in a way, in, in it clearly, that, that the clearest way I've ever heard anybody say it. She said, we got sick together. Thank God we can get well together. And that very clearly is the philosophy of this magnificent, magnificent get-together. But it did remind me of one other conference I was at where they actually had one of those flag ceremonies, banner ceremonies, and it was kind of in your neck of the woods at South Bay. And they do this flag ceremony, and so basically all the AA groups come prancing in, you know, with the, the name of their group on a, on a flag or a banner, and then they post it up all, all around the room, you know. And so, you know, they say get as creative as you can, which really means try to outdo the other one. We all know that. And so in they come, in they come, and then in comes this one that I'll, I'll never forget. Now, there, there's this kind of really elementary style for doing, for doing things, like kind of a writing style to, to kind of draw attention to certain things. So, so let's take an example of the Crested Butte Mountain Conference. So if you take the CBMC and you kind of stack the letters on top of each other, so you have a great big capital C, and it says rested after it, so crested, and then, you know, great big B, Crested Butte Mountain Conference. You got it? Kind of, or, you, or you, know, you kind of, you know, you, when, you're, when you're writing a love poem. You know, capital L, you know, L-O-V-E, one on top of the other. L is for laughter. And it's how I, I love how we laugh together. And O is for over the moon, which is how I feel when I'm with you. And, you know, V is for D, which you're going to get, you know, if you don't be careful. And, <laughs> and then you'll really be over the moon and the laughter will be done. But, you know, see, if any, you know, you know I digress. <laughs> but, you know, that, that's kind of the, the style, you know, of having the letters one on top of the other. So we're back to now to South Bay, and they're coming in with the banners, and, and in come the, these couple of women, and, and, and they're, they're prancing. And they're not wearing a little black dress. They're just wearing little. 
And they've got this, and then they're used, they use that style. And so they had, like their, the name of their group was, it had five, five words in it. And so they had the letters stacked up one on top of the other. And the name of their group is Sober Ladies Using the Steps. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm, just, I'm thinking, I'm not in Kansas anymore. And then my sick Al-Anon side kicked in and said, I wonder if they have any open meetings. <laughs> I'd love to go to one of those. <clears throat> Anyhow, up, uh, <clears throat> up where I'm from, we do this really strange thing. It's the only place I've ever seen anywhere in North America <clears throat> that the al do it. And so it happens in our group, it happens at all our conferences. Anybody that chairs, they ask the, they ask the Elon to identify. Like, like we're going to come here if we don't. <laughs> but just in case, you know, we don't want any, any, any um, kind of false Elon on here. But I guess it is important to identify your internet Elon because, as we all know, anybody can join AA. But you really have to know someone to get into Elon. <laughs> and so. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you that I've known five of them, <laughs> two by birth, and in more germane to the story, three by choice. <laughs> I've actually I've chosen three alcoholic women, and two of them I met in Al-Anon. Oh. Oh. Isn't that amazing? So I'm just here to tell you that if you're a female in an Al-Anon, you're here tonight, you're female and you're in an Al-Anon, and you think you might be having a problem with alcohol. Ignore anything that any of our fine friends in Alcoholics Anonymous are going to give to you. Any questions or anything they're going to say. And simply at the end of this meeting, come up to me and say, Do you find me attractive? <laughs> and if the answer is yes, run like hell to AA. Because if I think you're pretty, you're a drunk. It really is just quite that, quite that simple. Now, isn't that an amazing thing? That... Those of us in Al-Anon can laugh. And thank you for laughing along with me. Because too often in our Al-Anon meetings, we do not laugh. Because we are such victims, we believe. And there's nothing to laugh about. And there's a standard thing where you have a, a, a place where there's an AA meeting and an Al-Anon meeting at the same time. And you can hardly hear in the Al-Anon meeting because all the AAs are laughing. And, you know, they got to laugh about. <laughs> Don't they know what they did to our family? <laughs> and what I'm here to do is to encourage you to get away from that. And what I'm here to do is to encourage you to open your mind to this one thought. If you were a member of Al Anon, that what is wrong with us has nothing to do with the alcoholic. Nothing. Now we have this al on con that says the only requirement for membership is that there be a problem of alcoholism as a re- in a relative or friend. So it basically says, come here little girl. <laughs> come on in. But as soon as we get in, we say, no, you can't talk about the alcoholic. But you see, the tradition doesn't say that there be an alcoholic it's just that there be a problem of alcoholism. Because the alcoholic has their own problem. In my experience is, with all those alcoholics I've known, is that when they stop drinking, my problems do not get better. Because you see, I have been affected by and am now inflicted with a disease called alcoholism. One of our old al on posters, would say that here's was the big line. It says, you do not have to drink to suffer from alcoholism. Now, that is the idea. I would like you, if you're, if you're willing to kind of go with me for, you know, for this little bit of time that we have here tonight, I'd ask you to just open your mind to that. Because for too many years of my time in recovery, I said those words, I parroted those words, I read those words. But deep, deep, deep down, I said, no, they could quit. They really, really are the ones who have the problem, not me. I'm the good guy. I'm the one that everybody came to. I'm the one that was holding everything together. They were the ones out there doing that, not me. Yes, alcoholism is a family disease, and I'm affected by it. But really, I'm not. (laughs) 
and I stayed firmly stuck on that side. And it didn't work for me for a long time. Way back in the beginning, I was just this nervous little kid. There's a lot of drinking going on at home. We didn't know if that was the problem or not. My mother brought me to the doctor and gave me all kinds of tests. I was peeing all the time. I was throwing up all the time. And I was just, just like painfully afraid and frightened of people. And, and she was really, really worried about me. So she brought me to the doctor. They gave me all manner of tests. All the results of the test came back negative. And the doctor said, Mrs. Jatuk, there's nothing wrong with your son. But if there was a test for that disease that I do had then, and for the test that I have tonight, a test for the disease that I have tonight, it would be positive. Because the disease that I have is alcoholism, the family disease. And it was starting to show even when I was a young child. Now, we had this alcoholic at home. And I just kind of want to tell you just one thing about that because it kind of relates to some of the issues that, 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 we, that we deal with here. And so my dad, you know, he drank a lot of beer, loved it. And so my dad loved to do three things. He loved to drink, he loved to garden, and he loved to take off his clothes. I had one of those two. <laughs> Although I'm sure he was not nearly as attractive as you, Hilda. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> and so my dad, my dad would start on a Saturday morning, and he'd crack open the beer, and he'd start gardening in the backyard. And, you know, it does get warm in Canada sometimes, and in the summers it's actually pretty nice. And so my dad would start gardening in the back, and as he would work his way to the front. So by midday, many beers later, my dad would be in the front doing the gardening. And by then, the shirt was off, and like everything was off, and he was virtually as naked as you could be legally. And so get the vision. This is when, he was a beer drinker, so we know what the belly looked like. And this was the time, this was when everybody in the planet smoked cigarettes, and so he was certainly one of those two. And this is the time of life when nobody was afraid of the sun. As a matter of fact, we put oil on our bodies to attract the sun. Okay, so you're, you get the image here, you know, beer belly, cigarette, oil. <laughs> Drunk. <laughs> Front of the house. <laughs> There we are inside the house. And his, you know, he wasn't like, in the other images that he wasn't totally naked, but picture Bermuda shorts rolled up and down, basically turned into a thong. There, there, there we are. Yeah, the beauty of alcoholism. And so you can, I can just imagine, you know, like, like my mother married this guy. And at one time was probably attracted to him. But I really never saw her standing in the front room when he was out there looking like, like that, saying, get in here now, you hunk, I want you. It just kind of, that kind of part of the marriage just kind of flipped it away. <laughs> Funny what happens when the alcohol comes in. And so, there my, now my dad had this anger issue, like every alcoholic that, that I've ever known. The only people I know who are angrier than alcoholics are al <laughs> And so, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow if you choose to go to that workshop. So yeah, my, my, we had this guy in the street that used to love to race a car up and down the street. And my dad really, really got mad at this guy. And one day the guy stopped. And my dad went after him. And they had this to-do in the middle of the street. Beer bottle, cigarette, oiled up, beer belly, thought burrito shirts turned into a thong, and all the neighbors came out. Now there he is out there doing that. We're inside, embarrassed. And is that not classic? As a symptom of the family disease called alcoholism. He's out there making a fool of himself. We're embarrassed. He's out there showing his ass. We can't show our face. <laughs> Amazing thing. Years later, I'm happy to report to you that he got sober. That was a beautiful thing. And he really got sober. Got the bumper stickers, the whole deal. Live and let live. Let go and let God. What does my mother say to my father? For God's sake, Donald, why do you have those bumper stickers on the back of the car? Everyone's going to see them. I said, Mom, they've seen everything else. <laughs> But there it is. And who's that about? That is not about the alcoholic. That is about the Al-Anon. We're embarrassed when he's out there doing that. We're embarrassed when he's parking the car in the driveway instead of on the lawn. What is that about us? The al are going, ooh. The A's are going, <laughs> <laughs> This is the chance where the A's get to go to their Al-Anon spouse. <laughs> So anyway, a beautiful thing happened to me in 1968. Uh, my, mother, um, my mother was in Al-Anon. My mother's a 43-year member of Al-Anon. 
And there was a call that came out through the Allen meetings. There was an Alateen conference that was coming to Toronto. I was, 11, I was an 11-year-old boy. And, and so they said, we need houses for these Alateen members who are coming uh, to stay in. Now, this is before you needed to give a pint of blood and submit to a retinal scan before you could work with Alateen. Okay? <laughs> This was actually when, you know, they were, we were all part of this loving fellowship. Oh, I digress. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know if I need to stop saying that, but I, anyhow, no, I'm not going to, because really, that's the way it was. And so into this active alcoholic home, this is what my mother did. My mother said, I'll take three. And so, see, my mother knew that even though the doctor had said, Mrs. Jatuk, there is nothing wrong with your son, my mother knew that there was something terribly wrong with her son. And she was finding help in her al group. And she wanted that very same help to be made available to her child. And so she brought those three guys in, three guys from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and they walked into our front room, you know, the kind of the vestibule in our house, and an amazing thing happened to me. And this was all of those years ago, 40, 42 years ago, and I still remember that to, the, to this very day, the remarkable feeling that happened when they, those three walked in and we simply were able to sit down and talk. It was that powerful to this young boy. And that happens to the, right here this weekend. Every time we sit down and talk, it's the same thing. There's that immense power for the families of alcoholics, the same as it is for the alcoholics, that when one talks to another, we start to discover God. Because God can come in for the family members of alcoholism. And I went to their conference and I started going to Alateen and I went into, and I learned some really great things in Alateen. This is what they told me. They said, Rick, your father has a disease. He is not a disgrace. Now that is a hell of a good thing to hear. Especially given where I came from and all like the drama and trauma that happens in active alcoholism. We don't need to get into that, but we know what that is. We know what happens in the midst of, of active alcoholism. And to hear this blessed message that said, Rick, your father is an alcoholic. He has a disease. He is not a bad man. He has a disease. He is not a disgrace. I mean, I needed to hear that. I absolutely needed to hear that. And I stayed in Alateen right up to the time I was 21, and they kicked me out. So they said, you can't be bald and have a beard and stay in Alateen. You just got to go. <laughs> and I whiningly left and, and, and started going to Al-Anon. And I kind of hung around in Alanon for six years. And, and, and then, then I got to tell you, I met her. And she was as cute as Sarah. <laughs> And I did, and I left, I left Alan. So that's why when we do our countdown, I stand up at 23 instead of 42. Because I left, and I really left. And I went out, and I did a lot more qualifying. And when I came back, I came back with a bit more perspective than I had before. And I again came in on this side. My mouth was still saying, I've been affected by alcoholism. And that she turned out to be an alcoholic this been affected by alcoholism, but really deep down inside I said, but I'm really not inflicted with it. I really don't have it. And it took me a long time to cross the bridge from the side that said, it is them, to the side that says, oh my God, it is me. It is me. And it wasn't until I was able to cross the bridge from the side that said it's them to the side that said it's me that these blessed steps would work for me. Because here's the news, that the 12 steps cannot and will not work if I am unable to surrender. If I'm trying to work the 12 steps for something you have, they will not work. And I am doomed. And oftentimes the bottom for the Al-Anon is when we get exactly what we want. They stop drinking. And things get worse. Say, oh my God, what happened? So we divorce them and we go find another one. How many people have done that? How many people here have hooked up with one alcoholic? Put up your hand. This is a real question. Put it up. Don't be afraid. Okay, look around. That's a lot. It's a lot. Now put your hands up. How many people have done two? Okay, that's, okay now, now we're getting real. Okay, put it down. How many have done three? I'm still putting up my hand. Okay, there you go. All right. Now the question of, oh, how many people have gone to AA looking for one? <laughs> and 
And so I come back to the original premise. Is the problem in the alcoholic or is the problem in us? Or put quite simply, am I who I am because I chose an alcoholic or did I choose an alcoholic because of who I am? Oh. <laughs> Let's see what our literature says about that. This, I'm not making. I'm not going to make up what I'm, what I'm going to read to you. Is really in our literature. We don't often hear it, but it's really in here. Odat, May fourth. Many of my punishments are self-inflicted. Self-inflicted, not inflicted by them. Self-inflicted. In some way unfathomable to my human intelligence, my suffering could be the consequence of my own attitudes, actions, or neglect. June 3rd. If we really do want peace of mind, the first thing to realize is that it does not depend on conditions outside us, but those inside us. August 1st. Many of our troubles are self-created. Many of our personal agonies self-inflicted. August 3rd, if I accept the fact that the principal source of my unhappiness is in me, I'll be giving myself a good reason to do something about me. My happiness cannot possibly depend on my forcing changes in somebody else, nor does my misery come from anyone but myself. And on July 27th, it says, al prime purpose is to help us deal with problems that alcoholism has aggravated. Or as my sponsor says, adding an alcoholic to a person like me is like sprinkling Miracle Girl on my defects. <laughs> <laughs> now, a book was written in 1938, or it was, it was published in 1939, which makes sense they were writing it in 1938. And Al-Anon doesn't really want us to talk about that, that book. I don't know why. Um, so I'll just kind of say that, you know, it's a book that some people say is big. And, you know, when you see it, it, it actually is quite a, a book that, that, that's quite large, as a matter of fact. And, and um, it then wants to say the name, so we'll just say that, that it's anonymous. We'll just kind of leave it, leave it at that. So, anyhow, there is this anonymous large volume <laughs> that just happens to be the absolute bedrock standard for treatment for alcoholism. But, you know, we won't talk about that, that either. But back in 1938, when they were writing that book, this is what they knew. Listen to this. Whether the family has spiritual convictions or not, they may do well to examine the principles by which the alcoholic member is trying to live. Let's read out of your book. Go at the bottom of page 81. Our design for living is not a one-way street. It is as good for the wife as it is for the husband. Or in our talk today, it is as good for the family as it is for the alcoholic. So let's start there. If we can cross the bridge from it's them to, oh my God, it is me. What we have available to us, my dearest friends, is what for me and what I personally believe to be the most powerful tool for change that we know. And we have a promise, and a promise for the family members is as strong and as equal as it is for our alcoholic friends, that if we are willing to surrender, if we are willing to admit that we are powerless over alcohol, which means that and alcoholism is a disease, which means it's a disease I have, then we have open to us the promise. And the promise is that one simple promise, but will change our lives immensely. We will have an awakening into the spirit as family members of alcoholics that our alcoholic friends have as well. And we will know a new freedom. We will know a new freedom. And it forces me to take a look at who it is and what I am and what it is that I do, apart and separate from all of those alcoholics, because every one of them is either sober or dead. And what I need to say is that whether the alcoholic is alive or dead, drinking or sober, in my space or out of it, has nothing to do with how my disease marches on. And the difference between being affected and inflicted is, I don't know if there's a literary difference, but there's a psychological difference. Because as soon as I continue to say I'm affected by, that means I'm always focusing, there's always another person in the sentence. As soon as I say I am an adult child of an alcoholic, 
I am focusing on something else other than me. I am perpetuating being a victim. It's every time I say I grew up without, in an alcoholic home, I am perpetuating being a victim because I am placing the problem on the person, the alcoholic, and I'm not accepting that alcoholism is a disease, a disease that I have. And as some of that therapeutic language creeps into our rooms and we hear that we're codependent, I absolutely and totally reject it. I am not co-anything. I am a primary dependent, and I have chosen these alcoholics because I need to have somebody who needs me so that it, cause for a brief moment in time, it calms down the screaming in my soul. And that's what that does. And as soon as I start to put another person into that equation, I am hiding behind them. I am perpetuating being a victim, and I love being a victim. It destroys me, but I love it. I don't think there's anything that will destroy our recovery more than perpetuating being a victim. Because when I'm a victim, I'm blaming everything on you. And I'm always the good guy. The victim is never wrong. It's always the perpetrator that's wrong. And we continue to focus and focus external. The problem is inside, but I want an external solution, and there isn't one. So if it's inside, what do I do? What is it that I'm doing to destroy my life? And now and now we talk about this thing, you know, we're, poli- we're people pleasers. Well, that's kind of the biggest misnomer I've ever heard. Because what that means, what kind of in, what's buried in that statement is that I actually have had some element of my being that has regard for you. <laughs> and, and I really, that just has not been the case. <laughs> that I never really wanted to please you for anything or in any way. What I have wanted in the most desperate of ways is for you to approve of me. That's what I've wanted. I have had no regard for your care or for your well-being, but I have lots for mine. And when I am not accepting that there is a God, when I am not following a process to bring me to that spiritual awakening, I've got to find a solution. I have to. Because I just can't live with that screaming in my gut. I tried the booze. It didn't work. I'm one of those disgusting social drinkers. <laughs> there really are such unfortunates. <laughs> And I'm one of them. I'm the kind of guy that can open up a bottle of beer and drink half of it, put the cap back on, and put it in the fridge. Oh. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I have this beer. <laughs> That's kind of what the alcoholics go. They don't get that one at all. I have this dear friend at home, one of my dearest friends in the world, a fine, fine member of Alcoholics Anonymous. She's been at your conference here, Mildred Frank, you know, from, from Toronto, a lovely, lovely woman. Her and I go to the symphony regularly, and, and, and one year we're at the symphony and opening night. And so after the concert, big swishy affair, we're down in the lobby, and they're walking around with chocolate-covered strawberries and champagne and, and, and water. So Mildred and I have a strawberry each, and then they come by with the tray with the champagne and the water, and Mildred takes water, and I take water. And so Mildred looks at me, and says, why didn't you take the champagne? And I said, i got to go to work in the morning. (laughs) To which she replied, what does that have to do with anything? (laughs) Thus the difference between the alcoholic and the Al-Anon. One of our family traditions at home is that we'll have champagne and orange juice on Christmas morning. So we'll have a little bit of champagne and a lot of orange juice, and you can never buy the champagne in a half bottle. I don't know why. But you have to buy a big bottle of champagne. And so we only drink like a little bit of it. And so Mildred often will come over at Christmas. So she came over on Christmas one day just at the time my sister was emptying the rest of the champagne down the sink. I had to perform CPR right on the, right on the spot. And, and, and that, that's when she said, you know, that Rick, that is alcohol abuse. So I'm here to tell you that if alcohol would work, and I gave it a chance to work, and I never felt better, I just got sick. First time I drank, I drank eight ounces of straight rum, and I passed out. I woke up the next day sick as a dog. I did the same thing again five nights later, and I did that for like a, a year. And I said, I don't like this, and I stopped. And I've never had a problem with it again. I mean, it, I never felt better. It never changed anything. I just got sick. And then I met this female alcoholic. And my God, my world changed. Because that's what I needed. That's what did it for me. That calmed the screaming inside me. And there's another thing we do. And Alan and I, we say, you know, we have low sense of self-esteem. Really? Well, you know, it's kind of like as low as the belly of a slug, actually. But it's really, you see, I'm not here to concentrate on myself. 
as I've learned. And all of the work that I've done working through these steps and doing all this stuff, never one single time have I worked directly on self-esteem. I've just done the steps. I've started carrying this message to others. I've started sharing things with others. And all of a sudden, there was just this sense that I could just belong with you. Then I heard this AA member say this really simple thing, and I believe this to be gospel, that if you want to get self-esteem, do esteemable things. And I simply do not know of anything more esteemable than carrying this message like it asks us to do in step 12. I simply do not know of anything more esteemable than doing that. And this, you know, this kind of this rock bottom sense of self that I had was that, like I couldn't get my picture taken. I, I couldn't buy clothes. I could I'd chop away at my own hair. Now, I teach high school for a living. I'm a high school band director. That's what I do to, to kind of, you know, pay the bills and, and put food on my table. It's a great job and I love it. But they do this really annoying thing every year. They want to put your picture in the yearbook. And so when you have your, you know, when, when, when your, your lack of esteem is showing itself in all these ways, like I don't want to get my picture taken, I'd always say, oh, no, no, I don't want to pay, I just come up and see it. So if you look in the yearbook, for the first seven years of my career, there's just a blank space with my name underneath it. Picture not available. Now here I am, I have two university degrees, and I won't get my picture taken. I used to have hair, and it's, I was afraid to go to the barber. Because I'd sit in the front of the mirror and he'd say, how do you want to look? And I just wanted to disappear. So I would get the scissors and chop at my own hair. I wouldn't buy clothes because you'd look at yourself in the mirror. That's how mine came out. Nobody ever said, Rick, you're dumb, ugly, and stupid, ever. But somehow, in the midst of alcoholism, not the alcoholic, don't mix the two up. In the midst of alcoholism, nobody chose alcoholism. It just came in. In the midst of alcoholism, somehow I got that message. And I'm happy to tell you today that I get my hair cut by a barber who's in AA. <laughs> and it takes two hours to cut this measly little bit of hair because he goes snip, 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 and then we talk. <laughs> snip, 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 then we talk some more. And he gives me a little, it's lovely. Absolutely fantastic. I can buy clothes, and you look in the yearbook, and my picture's there. Beautiful. Doesn't say that in our promises, but in my promises it says you'll put the picture in the yearbook. Thank God. It's in there. Beautiful. But there's even other things that I would do. And remember, nobody's telling me to do this. These are the things that I am bringing into my life because I have alcoholism, the family disease. Drinking doesn't do it for me. I'm frightened of the world. There's a screaming inside, and I got to quiet it. And I met this female alcoholic. And it was just like an amazing thing. And the situation was that I, 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 I'd applied to go to a music school in western Canada, in the mountains. I kind of feel like I'm in the same kind of situation when I'm here. In Banff, Alberta was where I went to school. And I applied to go to this music school. I got accepted to go. And it was a program for brass quintets. I played the tuba. And so they said, call up four of the other players, two trumpet players, the French horn and the trombone, make an arrangement for a rehearsal, do some rehearsals before you come out to the program and you'll be ahead. Makes a lot of sense to me. So I called up the other, I called up one trumpet player, the trombone of the French horn, and then I called her. And I'm here to tell you that my attraction to female alcoholics, I didn't even have to see them. So what was supposed to be this short little conversation to arrange a rehearsal turned into this hour-long lust fest on the phone. And I mean, she was exciting. And she'd been places I wanted to go. She'd played music with people I wanted to play music with. She was alive. She was vibrant. And it was fantastic. And I'd never even set eyes on her. So we started to talk on the phone regular. We made her answer to the room. We started to talk. But I'm a good investigator. A really good one. So I started asking around about her. And I found out that she was really cute. found out that she was a really, really great trumpet player. And I found out that she was really experienced. And I wasn't. At least not with, with other people. It was a lonely life <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> I know, it's the altitude. <laughs> and and that, you know, that was exciting. And so we continued to talk on the phone, and, and this magic day came when we were actually going out to Western Canada to, to, to play music. And I was sitting at the airport with my mom and dad, my mom on the right side, dad on my left, and in she came. And guys, she was bouncing. It was heaven. Black little curly hair, she had this little blue top on, she had her suitcase in, her, in one hand and her trumpets in the other, and we just kind of watched her come down the terminal, and she stood right in front of us, and, and, and like... My mother had a cardiac arrest on the spot. The eyes popped right out of my dad's head. And she bent right down to put down her suitcase and trumpets. And I got a view. And I'd been in Alateen long enough to know I was about to have a spiritual awakening. 
this was just this was just amazing. She had been calling me. And I was, I was, I've been thinking all these things. You know, I can help you with all the problems that you have because you're sharing all these problems with me. And we kind of got on the airplane and we went out to the school and I had a beer. Now, when an Al-Anon tells you they have a beer, they mean one. Okay, let's just kind of get that clear. We, we mean one. And so she had one and she had two and she had three. She had five on the way from Toronto to, uh, to, to Banff. And, and if there's anything I say today that you can take to the bank, it's that she had five because I have never met an Al-Anon who can't count. <laughs> and we get out to this school, and we, and we and, and, I mean, it was fantastic. And we start playing music, and, 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 and then we, uh, I found out that there's certain things in life that are just fantastic when you do it with another person. But if you're an Al-Anon like me, there's something that's even better. So now you play music and you have sex, and then you have therapy. <laughs> oh, to heaven! Like I mean, like you see the Alan's going. Oh, I got, I got a shiver. <laughs> she would tell me her problems, and I would tell her how to fix them. <laughs> and, I, and like I had arrived. This was beautiful. In a couple of weeks into this, I used to call it a relationship. Mildred said to me one time, she said, no, Rick, it's not a relationship. That was a parasitic entanglement. <laughs> Try that if you're on some kind of dating website, looking for someone to have a parasitic entanglement. <laughs> Heard another guy say, it was, it's like two ticks without a dog. <laughs> Chewing away at each other. So whatever this... <laughs> Come on, we're out on. You're not supposed to be laughing. <laughs> Put that pickle back in your mouth. <laughs> so anyhow, a couple of weeks into this thing, whatever it was, of, of you know playing music, doing it, and then and, and, and then having therapy, this is what she said to me. And he got the truth that she said this to me. She said, Rick, you know, I've been seeing a therapist for a long time, but I don't need to see that therapist anymore. Because now I have you. Oh! And if you're an alcoholic, I'm here to tell you, no bottle of scotch can match that. You can dive in there and swim around in that. It is heaven! And I felt the way Bill talks about it, he felt, you know, he had arrived. I felt like I had arrived. I honest to God felt like I'd stand taller. I felt like I belonged with people. I felt like I had purpose. How can I be a nothing if somebody wants me and needs me? I mean, it was beautiful. Sick as all hell. But man, did it feel good. And for a brief moment in time, the screaming really did stop. But it really didn't stop. It just kind of got covered up. And over time, it was like a dog that catches a car. What do you do with it when you get it? You kind of get bored with it, but you don't lose it. You just go looking for another one. We got back from that school. People are saying, Rick, what are you doing with this woman? And am I saying, oh, she's really attractive. We have a lot in common. You're a great musician. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying, well, deep down inside, there's a beautiful person, and I'm going to help bring her out. It was like a project. Because you see, if I could help bring her out, wouldn't I look good? At least that was my perception, and that's all that matters. Whether that was true or not has no relevance. The only relevance is, is that's what I believed. And I was basing all of my actions on that. Sick? Absolutely. At the time, really, really fun. And so time went along, and I found myself, I finished university, I applied for a, I, I, I finished teacher's college, and I found myself sitting in front of a principal in an inner city school in downtown Toronto. We did this interview, and he said, Rick, you know, there's a lot of very needy students in this school. And I said, brother, am I the man for you? You want me. And he hired me. And he said, you know, people say these kids really can't do very much. And I thought, really? If there's anything an Al-Anon like me loves, it's a challenge. Now, was I doing anything to those kids because I wanted those kids to do well? Not a chance. The only thing I wanted was for you to look at me and say, he's great. And so I will use anything and anybody at any time in any way to get that. And so I used those kids. And three years later, we did a show, Fiddler on the Roof. 
These kids that couldn't play a note when I got there. Three years later, we did the show. The whole thing, singing, dancing, I conducted the orchestra, the whole deal. And at the end of the final performance, the principal of the school called me up from the pit where I was conducting the orchestra and hugged me in front of the entire audience, pushed me back but did not let me go, and looked me right in the eyes and said, Rick, I've made a lot of decisions since I've been the principal of this school. The best decision I ever made was to hire you. <laughs> yes! Now, this is the way alcoholism to family disease works in my life. Is there a God? Probably. But that was my power. Getting that approval. And that lasted for a little while, and it went away. And isn't that the truth? That anything of this earth, anything from any other person, any kind of approval, anything material, will not do it. Because it's not enough. It's not enough for me. It has the illusion of being enough at certain times, but it is not enough. And there are other things. I had this anger issue. We'll talk more, you know, if you choose to come. I'm going to kind of, I'm grateful for the opportunity to explore that tomorrow, this anger, fear thing. But I just let me say that this is kind of the way it came out in May. After when I came back to Al-Anon in 1987, I, I just forgot to tell people that I had been away for three years. I was still kind of pretending that I was being you know, this, this, this wise old timer. I was just BS, but it, that's what I was doing. And so one night I went to a very, very large meeting, and, and I, I always sit at the back, which is the control position, by the way. So if you're at the back, that means you can see everybody, but nobody can see you. <laughs> and that's where I always sat. And so I was sharing, but we would share in theater style, and we were sharing in step 12, and I was, I was sharing about this beautiful spiritual awakening, and a God is just my best friend, and oh my God. And two people beside me started playing with each other's shoelaces while the great one was speaking. <laughs> and a blood-curdling scream came out of me in my Al-Anon meeting at these two people. And then I reverted right back to speaking in very warm, soft, dulcet tones <laughs> about this marvelous spiritual awakening. I mean, it was completely psycho. And at the end of the meeting, nobody would talk to me. I wonder why. I was the group representative at the time. When I did that, you could see that the oxygen in the air got sucked out, and everybody thought the GR is killing somebody at the back of the room. And so I went home and I read my ODAT book, you know, about anger, and, you know, it's count to ten. I count to ten. I just want to kill you even more. <laughs> and it's kind of brought up all these other things that I would do. I remember one time I'm at home alone making a fried egg for dinner. That's what you do when you're a bachelor. And I broke the yolk in the frying pan. Oh. And I reached in there. I grabbed that goopy egg. I threw it against the wall. I took the frying pan, started smashing it on the stove, and looked around and realized that I was the only one there. <laughs> but what is that about? <laughs> or I'm driving along the street. And somebody dares to kind of stand on, step off the curb before I go by, so I point my car at them. <laughs> I'm not drinking. Not zero percent alcohol in my bloodstream. And then I'm, I'm, I'm driving to work one day, and, and, and this thought comes into my mind. Flick the wheel, Rick, and it's over. I'm walking in downtown Toronto by the lake. This thought pops into my mind. Just jump in, Rick. It's done. I'm on the sidewalk. A bus is coming. A thought pops in. One step, Rick. And it's done. I am not drinking. There is no one in my life who is drinking. I am living alone. And that's what's happening to me. And I discovered through a whole series of actually doing some real work that what is underneath the anger is abject terror. Absolute terror. And the only way that I could find any illusion of power was by getting mad or fantasizing about ending it for me. Because anger and rage is one coin. One side says homicide. The other side says suicide. It's the same thing. 
and I am not drinking. And there is no one in my life who is. Because you see, I have alcoholism, the family disease, my dear friends. And I would seek to control everything and everybody around me in any way that I could. Because you see, when you're frightened, you have to control. It's the only way I could find any kind of hope to calm the screaming. Or I perpetuated just being this victim. I loved being a victim. I blamed everything on the fact that my father was an alcoholic, his mother was an alcoholic, that wife was an alcoholic, those other alcoholic women, everything. And finally somebody one day said to me, he said, Rick, don't you think it's kind of pathetic that a 35-year-old man is blaming everything that's wrong in his life on his father? I don't want to talk to you anymore. But it is true. It's true. But it is just so icky, ooey, gooey fun to kind of involve yourself in that. But nothing has kept me down more. Nothing has kept me down more than being a victim. But as my sponsor said, Rick, you were never a victim. You have simply been a volunteer. Because victim is not something that happened to you, Rick. Victim is something you have chosen. And that's how my disease, alcoholism, the family disease, manifests itself in my life. I was an angry, whining victim. Now the definition of whining? Anger escaping through a very small hole. (laughs) 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 So if you're with me, if you haven't turned out, if this isn't too painful for you, if you're an al Because I know it can be. I know that. And I know that because so many people have said that. Because it's painful. it's been painful for me. But it's the freedom. I heard a guy say this one time. I love this. He said, if there's something that you need to get to, you want, you want the freedom, let's say. We want the freedom. We want to get to the other side. And I will look for every, any way to go around it, the right, to the left, above, underneath. I'll look for an opening. I'll look for any way to get to the other side without dealing with the thing that's the block, the wall. It's called the wall, the block. And this is what the guy said. He said, there is no way around the right or the left, the top or the bottom. And he said, there is no doorway. He said, the only way to the other side is through because the wall is the doorway. And is that not what our step four says? Is that not what our step five says? Is that not what happens when we make those amends? Is that not what happens when we continue that process? Is that not what happens? The wall is the doorway. How am I going to overcome my fear? I walk into my fear. I don't have to walk into my fear alone. I walk in there with you. I walk in there with the hand of a God. And I start to discover that God does. I start to take those actions, the God that I came to believe, you know, come to believe there's a power greater than myself. As I do each one of those steps, I really come to believe that there's one. Because things are starting to happen in my life that did not happen before. And as I start to get through, when I get to 11, I'm having this relationship with a God that is far different from the God that I thought I knew when I started. And that works for the family members of alcoholics. But it cannot work alone. And if you were like me, if you're an Al-Anon and have never had a sponsor, or if you're sponsoring yourself, or if two people are sponsoring one another, I don't know. But it wouldn't work for me until I asked somebody to be my sponsor. And I'm embarrassed to tell you how long I was here before I said those words. I can say this to you, know, that the sponsor I now have, I've had her for 16 years. And in two, in two, two weeks into July, she sent me an anniversary card saying, congratulations, we're 16 years in. I said, now how about that? Now my sponsor lives in the United States. She lives 1,800 kilometers away from me. It's an amazing thing how that worked out. It's the God deal of all God deals for me. Again, we come back to my friend Mildred. I needed a sponsor. I'm sick as all get out. I'm sitting in these rooms. I'm going to the meetings. I'm reading the stuff, and it's not working. I'm hearing powerful sharings like we heard last night. Heard on Monday night from Ralph, and like we heard last night from Hilda. I'm hearing powerful sharings like we hear from Ellen, like we hear from Beverly. We hear powerful sharings, and I'm going, this is not working for me. And it's not working for me because there is one thing I didn't do. I never surrendered enough to say to somebody, will you help me? 
I was trying to do it by myself, and by definition, it cannot work by yourself. The seminal moment in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous is not when Bill saw the white light. But certainly, he didn't drink from then on, we know that. But the seminal moment is that Mother's Day in that gatehouse at Akron, Ohio, when one man met another man. And Dr. Bob drank again, and so he's Margaret June. But that's the seminal moment when one met another. And that's what all of our steps say. We, we, we all over the place. We did this, we did this, we did this. And so unless I say to somebody, will you help me? I'm not going to get better. And so I met this woman. And I'm sponsoring her. I mean, Mildred introduced me to her. And I, on a Friday night, and she, she came to a conference in Toronto. We went out. We had this beautiful talk. And I thought, man, I like what this woman's got. And she, after she talked on Saturday night, she came to get me, and she said, hey, let's go get some more ice cream. And as we were walking on the street in downtown Toronto over to this restaurant, she asked the pre-sponsor question. She said, tell me about you. And so I said, well, you know, I just tried to chop my, head's wife, my, my wife's head off with an axe on a camping trip. And she laughed because she just finished telling us the story about trying to drown her husband in a bathtub. And I identified. And I had had this list I'd had this list of things for a sponsor. The sponsor must be a man. The sponsor must live close by to me. The sponsor must be this, this, and this. And I left off that the sponsor must be a potential murderer. I just kind of, I didn't put that on there. But God knew. And I was powerfully attracted to what this woman had. And so I went away. And I wrote a letter. I went to Leeds Summit, Missouri. And I wrote a letter in the chapel at that blessed place. And I said, I absolutely loved meeting you. And I said, I want what you've got. I am sick to death of doing this alone. And if you will be my sponsor, I will do absolutely anything you ask me to do. And I sealed the envelope and I dropped it in that mailbox. About a week later in home in Canada, I got a package. I'm thinking, well, hot dog. You know, she talks a lot. Maybe, you know, this is either like a, a really, really long rejection letter or I'm in. And so she said, you know, she said, I still have this letter at home. We did a sponsorship workshop together once a couple years ago, and I read the letter out. And, and she said, you know, it's lovely meeting you, too. And I, I said, you know, I wasn't going to take on another long-distance sponsee. And how am I going to sponsor a man because she's a woman? And doesn't Al-Anon tell us that only women sponsor women and men sponsor men? But what it really says is that people sponsor people. That's what it really says. And she said, I prayed about it, and I talked to my husband about it. And he said, quite simply, is it a legitimate Al-Anon request? And she said, well, yes, it is. And then she said this to me. She said, Rick, welcome to the family. I'd been in Alateen for 10 years, sponsorless. I'd gone to Al-Anon for six more, sponsorless. I left for three. I came back and was in for seven, sponsorless. And finally... The grace of God came in and said, Rick, you got to do it. Welcome to the family. And I sat at my desk and cried. I said, I finally have an opportunity to get what you've been talking about. And that's the last nice thing she just had to me for a year. <laughs> she slayed me. Absolutely like, creamed me. And it was exactly what I needed. She said, Rick, you will work these steps this way. Do I have a choice? You have no choice, she said. You will buy every book that al has. You will use that large anonymous volume. I said, but that's not conference approved. She said, well, how are we going to practice the 12 steps of AA ourselves unless we use the book called AA? Well, that makes sense to me. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, it, and it still makes sense to me. Like it's the foundation text. How are we going to practice the 12 steps of AA ourselves, which it says in our tradition, unless we use the foundation book? So I used that book as part of my stuff. And I went through this, this stuff we did with step one. It basically said, you know, here, read all this stuff, answer these questions. We shared the answers, and then she said this to me. Now listen to this. She said, congratulations, Rick. You have been, done step one to the best of your ability. Doesn't mean I'll never go back, but you've done it to step one to the best of your ability today. Now listen. Move on. Take that in. That's not an approval sucking. That's a breath of life. Move on. And I did the same with two. I did the same with three. I did the same with four. I did the inventory. I got an airplane, came down and did my five. It took two days to do the fifth. When we finished the fifth, we went out in her backyard and we burnt it. And every single page we said a prayer together. And there were a hundred pages. 
And we come back into her house and I sat down and I looked at her and I said, you know, I said, there is not a single thing I have not told you. And you know what she said to me? She said, Rick, I love you more because I know you better. I love you more because I know you better. My deepest fear was that if you knew me, you would abhor me. You would loathe me if you knew me. That my MO was, what do you want me to be? I'll be that. I'll be a chameleon in any situation I can be in just so that you'll like me. What I found out was completely the opposite. My whole life I had been trying to get to Los Angeles, but I was walking towards New York. And what the steps do is they take us. And we hear it all the time. We have to do, to do these, these actions contrary to our feelings. I never felt like doing any of those steps, but it is the greatest wisdom we have. If you don't want to do it, that's what you got to do. Take what you like and leave the rest? No! No! Leave what you like and do the rest. That's what works. Because I want to get there, but I'm walking that way. So we do these steps, and we do them with the sponsor. We share it with our friends. We listen to others, and it, start, it starts to move us. It just does. Even if we don't want it to, it does. And the promise is there for us, and it points us like that and say, Rick, you can walk that way. You can be an honorable man. You can be truthful. You can be real. You do not have to be a chameleon in every situation you're in. You can be the same Rick wherever you are, at work, at your meeting, in the grocery store, on the road. You can be the same guy everywhere because who you are is good enough. Our public relations policy is attraction rather than promotion. Is that not an awesome personal relations policy? That I do not have to force my way into your life. I do not have to trick my way into your life. I do not have to bend myself to be something I think you want me to be just so that you will have me, and like, which is basically lying in my way into a relationship. I do not have to do that. After the third alcoholic ended, my sponsor said to me, she said, Rick, I think you need to take a break. <laughs> now, in sponsor speak, that means celibacy, just so we have that clear and read up. And she said, I think you should try four months. And I thought, okay, I, you know, I can't do the four months. And so I did the four months, and I visit my sponsor every year between Christmas and New Year's. And on New Year's Eve was the end of the four months. So I said to her in the middle of the afternoon, I said, hey, my four months are up tonight. I'm thinking there's a Playboy bunny going to come running through the door at midnight. And hot, or Sarah. <laughs> hot, <laughs> And so she says to me, she says, well, you know, I've been thinking that, you know, that you might want to extend that. And I said, you know what, I think that that's a good idea. And upon, you know, have you ever said something you really want to take back instantly? <laughs> what did I just say? But I, it was a good idea. And what she said was, she said, Rick, you need to discover, you absolutely need to discover that women are people. Not objects for your sexual satisfaction. Is that right? I really didn't know that. I would say I knew that, but I didn't know that. She said, Rick, you need to discover that you're okay alone, that you can make your own meals, that you can look after yourself. Because she said, until you do that, you will never be able to get yourself into any kind of long-lasting, meaningful relationship. And God knows you've had enough of them that haven't worked. Are you willing to really try something different? And I said, yeah, I am. And again, you know, at the end of the year, I'm thinking, you know, Sarah's going to come marching through the door and, you know, we're just going to be great. And, and that didn't happen. And so another year went by and it was two years in and, and I'm thinking, man, you know, I'm whining to my sponsor. You know, like, I have needs. And she's saying, God has a plan. She said, you just keep on going. And three years came and went. Four years came and went. And I thought, I'm going for the record. <laughs> to heck with it. I just don't care. I was starting to develop friendships, and I found out that there's an amazing thing that can happen with a woman when you're not always trolling. <laughs> you actually can hear that they're people. And you can spend time with them, and you bring them home, and you don't go to bed with them. You actually go home. And you can actually go out with them two or three or four times and realize, lovely friend, not relationship material, and there's nothing wrong. So when you kind of get into it right away, you know, in three days in, you're going, ooh ee seemed great three to three days ago. Right now, how the hell do I get into this? And it's a long time to get out. Intense pleasure, intense pain, intense pleasure, intense pain. It stopped. 
It totally, totally stopped. So I just, I just didn't care. I was going for the record, like I said, and I'm at an Allen on day in Toronto, and this woman comes over and sits down beside me, a really beautiful blonde, and I kind of look over and think, the drought is over. <laughs> <laughs> She hates it when I say that, but it's exactly what I thought. And we're here to be honest. And that's exactly what I said. So I put my hand out, shook her hand, and said, Hi, I'm Rick. And she said, Yes, I know who you are. That made me feel good. And you know, bolstered my ego. And that's all I said. And I didn't see her again for six more weeks. And I saw her at our al conference. And I talked to her. And I didn't pursue her at the conference. I'm going to say something that might be controversial. It was important for me. I believe it's important for us, but it's important for me to keep our rooms safe. That if I find, we meet people here that we're attracted to, but this is not a dating service. So it's important not to use these rooms to pick somebody up. You know the old saying, you know, kind of the corniest but funniest line ever. If you're coming to AA or Al-Anon looking for a partner, the odds are very good but the goods are very odd. <laughs> I don't even know why people laugh at it anymore. It's like it's just the oldest line ever, but it is funny. I say to my partner, "Honey, you got the oddest one of all. So this is what I did. I phoned a friend of hers and I said, would you call Lee's, that's my partner's name, Lee's, L-I-S-T, would you call Lee's and ask her if I could have her phone number and tell her that this is not an Al-Anon call? <laughs> And so her friend did, called back, said, yes, you can have her number. We started clean. We started honest. We started real. So when we went out for a date, it was a date. And when we got home, we didn't have to think, you know, am I going to kiss her goodnight or say the Lord's Prayer? We didn't have to do that. It was honest. <laughs> I love the laughter of identification. Eh? It's beautiful. And so we started this, and in a few weeks in, and this was a real relationship, a few weeks in, I said, you know, I really need to do this different. I need to go slow. She said, thank God. So do I. That was 10 years ago that I said that. Nine years, well, one year ago, nine years it took, we finally made the, we finally moved in together. But for nine years, we were single. Like we had a place to go. And the marriage is coming. Give me one, I'm not a big commitment guy, but I'm working into it. <laughs> She's beautiful. Her name is Lee's, and, and, and it, it is working. And so I, I just want to share a little bit, you know, the last little, little bit of time I have. You know, we have many gifts that happen to us all, and, and I just love it when we get to the point in our stories when we can share the gifts that come. These aren't necessarily things you read in our books that are promises, but they are things that happen to each of us as a result of working these blessed steps and these traditions. Lise has three children. I have none. I love, I love teenagers. I've never really had any experience with little kids. And um, I said to my sponsor, I said, I don't know how I'm going to do this with her, these three kids. When I started dating her, her youngest was 16, the oldest was 21. They're now 26 and 31. But um, this is what my sponsor said to me. It harkened back to the tradition that our personal relations policy is attraction rather than promotion. And she said this to me, and it was all she said. She said, Rick, let the kids come to you. You just be who you are, and you taught me how to be who I am. And so I didn't try to be their father. I didn't try to force my way in. I didn't try to ingratiate my way into their life. I wasn't asking them to go out and play softball on the street. I wasn't doing any of that. I just looked for every opportunity that I could to chat with them, to talk with them. It just, it just felt very, very natural. Her youngest son had the hardest time. I'd used to come over. I'd walk in and say, hi, Phil. He'd walk out of the room and bump me as he left. Hated it. You know, he, just, he just couldn't stand the fact. That, but I just, so I, just kept, I just kept being present. I didn't. Any opportunity I had with him. And as the years went on, beautiful things started to happen. He's his oldest son, who wasn't around much. Bought a house, <clears throat> needed some help with the house, and he said, "Hey, Rick, you know, could you help me look for opportunities?" Derek had loved to help, help him. Help him build a deck in the back of his yard. Didn't talk a lot, but we were just being present to one another. He's his daughter, second child. When she got married, she said, "Rick, would you say the would you say the prayer, the blessing over dinner at my wedding?" I said, "Julianne, I'd love to." It was a perfectly appropriate way to invite me in. 
the youngest son, the one that bumped me when he went out of the room. When he finished college, he had two months where he needed a, a place to live, and I had an apartment. I used to live in this old, old, big old house in downtown Toronto. I had an empty apartment in the upstairs. He said, Phil, hey, you can come and live with me. And the youngest son that used to bump me as he went out lived in my house for two months. And 14 months ago, Julianne, had a, the, the daughter, had a baby. A beautiful experience. I had no children. And 20 minutes after this baby was born, I was invited into the delivery room with Lise, with her ex-husband, with her, um, her the new wife, the, the boys. And they allowed me to be present for this. I mean, if you've ever done it, like, there's really no word to describe that. And this son that used to bump me when he went out of the room reached over and shook my hand and said, congratulations, Rick. You're going to be a really important part of this little guy's life. How does that happen? Well, it happens when there's a God in our life, when we simply accept that God. And that little guy has become a pretty important part of my life now. I have no children. I've never been a father, and I'm called Grandpa Rick. And, and a few months ago, I, they, 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 there was an opportunity where I needed to babysit. And so the, I, I baby, they, gave me, they said, Rick, can you look after Lucas? And so I said, I'd love to. They trusted me to look after this little kid. And so, you know, I played with him a bit. And then this beautiful thing, I was sitting on the couch, and I just kind of kind of put him right beside me under my arm, and he just kind of snuggled in. And I, I just thought, thank you, God. They never promised this in any of the books, but I just showed up, and they've invited me in. And it is so blessed. And I have this father who's an alcoholic, an absolutely beautiful man. And he was sober for 24 years and 10 months. And he drank again. For eight years, he drank again. And four years ago, he came back and slept again. And in October, if he makes it to October, he'll live three years. And I'd spent a lot of time having, um, trying to have a relationship with this man. The hardest one. Of all, isn't it the, the ones that are closest that are the hardest? And I'll tell you this last story. And the sponsor told me never to end my, never to stay, stay a talk without doing this story. So I'll do it. Follow our direction. So I was always talking to my sponsor about, you know, wanting to have this relationship because I was going to my father looking to, for approval from my dad. And always, always, always. And she said, well, you know, why don't you just try to do th- some things with your dad instead of just sitting around talking to him and kind of s- sneakily looking for approval? And I said, that's a really good idea. And so I, but my dad loved the outdoors. He taught me that too. And you know, I went whitewater rafting today. It was a blast. So I said to my dad, let's go canoeing. He said, son, that'd be fantastic. So we went on a still water canoe trip one night, two days. We had a great time. He was sober. I mean, a program, we're kind of connecting and that worked out well. And he we said, well, hey, let, let's try another one of those. So we went out for two nights, three days, and that was fantastic. But, you know, I, I'm kind of an Al Anon of, of, of Ralph's alcoholic type, and so is my dad. You know, if one is good, two is great. Well, like 50 is the best. <laughs> and so, you know, what, the, one night out was good, two nights was fantastic. We said, well, you know, let's take a 16 day one. And let's take it to a place that's so far north the sun doesn't set on, on, on level five whitewater. That sounds great, Dad. Let's do that. So that's exactly what we did. We signed up for this trip down a river in the Northwest Territories in Northern Canada. It's called the Nahani River. And it literally took four airplanes to get there. The last airplane, you land on a gravel bar, and they jump all your stuff off and say 16 days that way, and the water's like insane. At least we had a modicum of intelligence. We had a guide. And so he was in the other canoe with the one other person, and I was in the canoe with my dad. And so they need to teach you how to work on this, on this, this really, really fast whitewater. So a high-sided canoe with a big skirt over the canoe, and then two guys pop up. It's like a big two-man kayak because you go over one wave and through another, right? And then the water kind of will disperse. But canoes are great, but they don't have any brakes, and you've got to get out of a canoe. And so there are these things on the water, Janet, called eddies. And so the eddy is when the fast water is going forward, but then there's places where it goes backwards, reverses. And so you do this thing called an eddy turn. And you do a few maneuvers, and you actually flip the canoe around 180 degrees, and you basically just float right into the shore, and then you can get out of the canoe. Now, Dad was in the back, the control position. I was in the front, the weenie position. And the guy taught us, that's my sponsor's word for me, my weenie man. And so we, the guy taught us how to do this. And uh, the first day was great. You know, we do this, this, this. We do it. Fantastic. High five, Dad. Love it. Great. The second day, we had to get out of the canoe. Dad's at the back saying, well, let's do this, this, this. Hey, fantastic. Know how to do this. Good. Day three. He's telling us how to do it again. 
And I get a sentiment. He's telling me how to do it, and I'm thinking, I know how to do this. And I had a sentiment. The next day, we had getting out of the boat, and he's yelling at me how to do it, and I get a resentment. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, I know how to do this, Dad. But did I say that? Not at all. Not at all. Day six, day seven, day eight. Comes, he's always telling me how to make this eddy turn, and we're out here trying to bond, and I'm just like, it's wrapped in my head. This. And, and finally, he tells me how to do the eddy turn, and I explode at my father, screaming at the top of my lungs, I know how to make a goddamn eddy turn. And I look right around at him, and at that p- specific moment in time, he thought it was the best time in the world to say, I love you. <laughs> What is that about? I don't know. And that's it. I'm done. I am done. And like my sponsor says, an octopus is on my face and it's over for me. So I have to go through the rest of this trip. I get home. I call my sponsor. Any good sponsor will ask you a question and then they'll wait for an answer. She asked me the question I, and, and she said, how was the trip? I said, you want to hear about the trip? And all I told her about was my dad. And she's kind of waiting. <laughs> Complaining, 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 complaining. Then she says, tell me something good. And I was absolutely silent. I had nothing to say. And she says, you mean to tell me that you were spent 16 days in the most beautiful country you can imagine and there is not one good thing that you can remember? No, I can't. And she said, this is your assignment. You meditate on that for a week and I want you to give me a list of the good things and you talk to me next Monday. I talked to my sponsor every Monday night, and I did. It took me a week. Found seven things. Phone her up. Say, hey, my assignment is done. Here are the seven things. She said, very good. Now you're going to write your dad a letter. I said, do I have to mail it? <laughs> she said, yes, you do. And she said, now this is a love letter. This is not one of those letters full of vitriol and hate where you're blaming him for everything in your life. She said, this is a love letter to your father. So I said, dear dad, I want to thank you for the trip down to the honey. Thanks for helping me out with the money, Dad. I, I, did, I, didn't, I couldn't afford it all. I really appreciate the fact that you helped me out a bit with that. I said, Dad, I want to tell you how proud I am of you, that you knew more about the plant life, the geography, the, the stars, than the guide. I said, Dad, I want to tell you how proud I am that at being of your age, he was in his early 60s, that you were able to do a trip with that kind of physical that demand, had those kind of physical demands. I said, I hope I can do that when I'm your age. And I said, Dad, I want to thank you for helping me down the mountain. Because you see, I'm afraid of heights. One of the activities on the trip was to stop for lunch and take a hike up a mountain. I started up with them. Halfway up there, we're stopping, looking around. The other guys are saying, man, this is great. And I'm thinking, too high, too far. And when they start to move back up the mountain, I say, no, I think I'm going to go down. And a magical moment happened. That my father looked at his adult son and quite simply said, I'm going to go down with Rick. And he took some steps down and he said, hey, son, come on down this way. And he took some more and he said, hey, son, come on down this way. And my father led his adult son down to the river. And we waited for the guys, other guys to come. And in the blindness of my resentment, I forgot that. And I wrote that in the letter and I thanked him. And I sealed the letter and I brought it up to the mailbox and I posted it. And I said, unless he, if he's alive in three days, he's going to get this. I'm not going to have to bury this at the grave. I'm not going to have to tuck this into the coffin. He is going to get this. And he called me a few days later after he got the envelope and he'd been crying. And he said, son, I got to tell you, I got your letter. He said, Rick, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever received in my life. He said, it's a trip of a lifetime for me. He said, I love you deeply. I will never forget this. And I said, Dad, I love you too. And that started a relationship with my father and I, unparalleled to anything I'd had. The approval seeking was gone, and the love allowed to flow. My father now keeps that letter in the photograph album on the coffee table in his front room. And anybody who comes in, they get to look at the photograph album and read my letter. And what that, I used to get upset about that. What my sponsor said, no, don't get upset about that. Because what your father is doing is he's saying to everyone, I have a son who loves me. And you know what? He does. Because you see, my dear friends, my father is an alcoholic. He is not a bad man. My father has a disease. He is not a disgrace. He is an intelligent, loving, humorous, responsible man that I love deeply. 
And I am so grateful that I have had that, have that relationship with him to this very day, even in his new sobriety. It's, it's amazing. There's a picture that stands in an altar in the side chapel of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, England. A picture of a traditional row figure standing with its right hand raised, knocking on the door of a cottage. Up in the top corner of the picture, it says, The Light of the World. The rope figure is holding a lantern in one side. There's stuff all over. Underneath it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. And as every single one of us knows, there's no doorknob on the outside, but it is on the inside. And that God has been knocking for a long time, but he will never barge in. And when I take these actions, when I start to open that up from the inside, Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.